Hey you guys, we are live here on Facebook and YouTube. It is Wednesday night, July 12th. Tonight's topic is going to be about diabetes and I'm gonna briefly go over the three types of diabetes and one that might be very shocking to you which might be prevalent in your life or in your future just because of the way we are designed as women and some of the things that we're going through as we age. And then we'll talk briefly a little bit about how um, intermittent fasting can kind of help you with battling, offsetting, or possibly even reversing some of these diabetic states. So if you are new, my name is Diane. Thank you so much for jumping on with us. We go live Monday through Friday, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, both on YouTube and Facebook simultaneously. So make sure that if you're jumping on on Facebook, you hit that like button so you'll know when we go live. And if you are here on YouTube and you are a new viewer, please take a second to hit that subscribe button so that we do go live here on YouTube, you will be notified as well. Just a little bit about me. My name is Diane, I'm 51 years old. I have spent the last 25 years or so helping women find nutritional plans and fitness programs to help them look and feel their best and what I think is most important, living their most authentic life around food. We have been talking over the last few months about how to incorporate intermittent fasting as an aging woman in today's world and being able to do those things, looking and feeling our best and living our most authentic life in and around food. Tonight we're gonna to discuss a little bit about diabetes. I do have to make this disclaimer. I am not a doctor. I am not a registered dietitian or nutritionist. I am a 50 year old woman who has been working in the health and fitness industry for the past 25 years. And I have been helping women battle some of these things that we've been talking about tonight just by learning how to listen to their bodies and considering some alternative food options because of the way food is making them feel. I was a victim or a product of what we're gonna talk about tonight and I was able to reverse some of the things that I was battling through what I now teach as a course with intermittent fasting and living with um, our body as we're changing in today's world and with what we're doing with nutrition and diet fads and, and exercise and managing our hormone, hormones. So I was part of this discussion that we're gonna to have tonight and I no longer am and I'm gonna share with you some of the things that I've, what I've done and then invite you to kind of consider uh, possibly joining our course that we have starting on July 15th if you are sort of feeling some of these things or are subject to this maybe in your even in your family or your life. So we're gonna talk about diabetes. There's actually three types of diabetes which might be a little shocking to some of you because we often hear about the type one and the type two diabetes but there's actually a third one that's on the horizon called the type three diabetes and I'll kind of brief um, briefly go over that toward the end. So what is type one diabetes? So we often Think of type one diabetes as that diabetes condition that you're sort of born with. Um, it often, we often think of it as being sort of something that children have to deal with. Um, but I'm gonna explain to you the kind of formal description and anytime I talk about anything that has to do with medical stuff, I always make sure that I type up a little summary of what I'm gonna talk about and write up some notes so that when I'm talking live, I make sure I don't misspeak because I'm gonna refer back to my notes. So excuse me while I look down, but I wanna make sure that I give you guys um, the exact information that you need and I'm not going to make any slip up with, word, with words so that um, I don't confuse anyone. So here we go. Type 1 diabetes. This is formally called juvenile onset diabetes. So that's how most of us know about uh, type 1 diabetes. It is called also called insulin dependent diabetes. So it is the type of diabetes that you have to take insulin for. There's no choice about that. There's no curing yourself of this. It is just a condition that you are born with, that your body just has the inability to produce insulin, so you have to actually put it in your body. Um, it, it is also kind of described even further as um, a condition in which your pancreas can't make insulin. So you can't change your diet, you can't change your lifestyle, it's just a fact that your insulin is not being produced by your pancreas and so you actually have to put it in your body um, so that it's present within your bloodstream. So we all know that insulin is a hormone that helps your body uh, convert sugar into energy. So without putting this insulin in your body as a type one diabetic, you would not have that conversion process take place and it can be life threatening. 
So um, some of the research that I found says that, you know, some people can actually live as a type 1 diabetic and not really realize that they have this condition until they, they kind of progress through life and start to um, go through maybe some hormonal changes because we know insulin is a hormone. And so they're saying that, um, that um, most oftentimes it's diagnosed before someone turns 19, but there have been times when, when even later in life you're diagnosed with it. And so you probably just sort of, um, dealt with the symptoms that came with type 1 di diabetes and didn't know that you could feel a different way. Um, and so um, um, it's that thing that you kind of just have to, mon especially if you have kids, you just have to kind of monitor their um, kind of activity, monitor what they're doing with their food, monitor how they're feeling. And if you feel like anything suspicious, I always say, you know, you want to make sure you bring up some stuff when you go to your well checks or whatever at the doctor. So it is um, most commonly found um, in, um, in the ethnic group for white people. So Hispanics, African Americans, Asians typically are lower um, on the incident level with type 1 diabetes and it affects boys and girls equally. So it's not gender specific um, as children are aging with the type 1 diabetic. So type 1 diabetes is the juvenile onset or insulin dependent diabetes, which means you have to actually take insulin in for your body to have it present. Your pancreas does not uh, sort of release the insulin, insulin hormone into your body. Okay, so that's type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes. This is the one that we're probably most familiar with, um, and we probably have maybe some familiarity with it because someone in our family might be suffering from it, or you might be um, suffering from it yourself. I know I was in a pre-diabetic state, so that would put me like just on the cusp of being a type 2 diabetic. Um, and so I'm going to explain a little bit about what two, type 2 diabetes is and then some of the characteristics of it in case you maybe want to look for some symptoms or, or signs within you or maybe someone that you love. Okay, so type 2 diabetes, formerly called adult onset or non-insulin dependent diabetes. So non-insulin dependent, meaning that your body doesn't necessarily have to have to have an input of insulin to survive, so you're not dependent on it. And if you were to able to, if you were able to reverse your type two diabetic state, then you can get off insulin. So your insulin is only used to kind of correct the situation. Um, and it's formally called adult onset diabetes because it was just sort of a lifestyle thing that adults kind of grew into because of lifestyle and nutritional habits, but we're finding now because of some of the dietary guidelines that we live by and some of the ways um, that we use convenience foods or the sedentary lifestyle that a lot of children are living, that now children are also um, being di diagnosed with type 2 diabetes as well. So no longer just the adult onset, it is also um, part of the childhood and youth community as well. So. It can be developed at any age, sadly. So again, it's that thing that we gotta make sure that we're not only living a healthy lifestyle for ourselves, but that we're modeling it for the generations behind us so they can see that what we're doing and then have an opportunity to kind of make some changes for themselves. Um, type two diabetes accounts for the mass majority of people who have, um, um, who have diabetes, so 90 to 95% out of 100 people are the type 2 diabetics. Um, your body, when you're type 2 diabetic, doesn't have the ability to use insulin in the correct way. So you have insulin in your body, your body is just not processing and using it correctly, so you have those blood sugar problems that you can no longer control without making having some sort of intervention, either lifestyle change or using insulin. Um, uh, so when your body is in a type 2 diabetic state and you're not able to use insulin the right way, it's, it's also called insulin resistance. So your body's sort of resisting the insulin that's being released as a hormone release and you're not able to process it through your body in the way in which it's intended to be used. Um, you can either make too much insulin or not enough insulin when you're type 2 diabetic. So there's sort of two ways that you can be diagnosed and you'll have to go to your doctor and get some blood work done to figure out what, um, what stage of type 2 diabetes you're in. And um, when your pancreas makes less insulin than your body needs, so not an overproduction of insulin, which would be the insulin resistance, you're called insulin deficiency. 
deficient. So you want to make sure that you're kind of, you know where you are, either insulin resistant or in insulin deficient. I was insulin resistant. Um, so what we want to keep in mind about, about the type 2 description is just sort of what it does in our system and understand that we can either have an overproduction or an underproduction of insulin and either way is not good but that type 2 diabetes can be managed with nutrition and lifestyle changes. Oftentimes it's managed with a prescription of insulin from your doctor. Um, I won't go into those things on this talk, but just be aware you know, that those kind of things aren't always the best uh, way to handle diabetes for the long haul. Short term, yes, but, but lifestyle change is always the best way to handle those kind of things. Okay, so here's a scary thing about type 2 diabetes. Women are at risk for um, the possibility of having type 2 diabetes when we have these sort of risk factors in our life. If you've had a gestational diabetes when you were pregnant, so if you were pregnant and you had to use insulin to, to regulate your blood sugar levels, then you have, are at higher risk of um, getting type 2 diabetes as you age. Um, irregardless if it runs in your family or not. So it doesn't have to have a history of it. It's just that you had to have been um, uh, diagnosed with gestational diabetes when you were pregnant. If you were a woman who delivered a baby that weighed over nine pounds, you're also at higher risk of type two diabetes. That was me. I had a 9.3 pound baby when I was 34. Gabby was over eight pounds, but she was only that weight because we induced labor early because I was on blood thinners with her and I had to kind of control the delivery date. So I'm sure she would have been over nine pounds too. I did not have gestational diabetes because I controlled my diet. I was afraid of it and I didn't want to be at risk for diabetes. So I managed to stay out of that zone. Um, both times I was pregnant because I knew it was a risk, but I didn't know the nine pound thing. So I'm at risk because of that. And then if you had polycystic ovary, ovary, ovary syndrome, you're also at risk for type two diabetes as a woman. So three instances where irregardless of kind of what you're doing, if you're just casually kind of flowing through life and you think you're not at risk, those three things as a woman increase your risk of type 2 diabetes. So be aware of that and know what your history is so that you can maybe take some precautions to avoid that situation for yourself. Um, okay, here's where it gets really scary. I, I don't even know what other word to use. And, um, and what's really got my attention and my research radar on and what I'm doing with experimenting with my body and what I'm most specifically doing with my intermittent fasting for not only myself but what I'm sharing here with you guys and with the women that are in my courses. The third type of diabetes. It is called insulin resistant diabetes and it's dubbed now type 3 diabetes. It is directly linked to Alzheimer's disease. If you have type 2 diabetes or you have the risk factors for type 2 diabetes, you're also at high risk for type 3 or Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so we've talked a lot about um, Alzheimer's disease here, insulin resistance, we've talked about um, intermittent fasting. So this is where we're going to kind of bridge the gap on all three of those things and then see why it is that intermittent fasting is so key for us women as we are aging today. So. The correct term for di the type 3 diabetes is insulin resistance in the brain. So we talk about how as we get to a certain age and our hormones start to change, we get that foggy brain, we forget where we left our keys. I talk about how I had to park my car in a very specific place every time I went to Target because I couldn't remember even driving through the parking lot to search for a parking spot. Like I was doing very specific things so that I could just remember something that happened five minutes ago. I could, was at a period of time where I was looking at my kids and I could not remember their name. I would walk into a room and not remember why I was, why I was in there. Um, scary, scary, scary time for me. And I didn't really realize all the little pieces that were put in place and what the end result was for me. But now that I have the big picture, listen to what I'm gonna describe to you and see if any of this sounds familiar. So the memory part was a big deal. I was putting on a bunch of body weight in fat that was from head to toe that I had no control over, no matter how hard I dieted or how much I exercised. I was fatigued. I, um, I felt like um, 
uh, depressed all the time. I mean, all of those symptoms that we feel that we sort of dub as the whole perimenopause and menopausal thing, which is part of it, is also direct, directly linked to this. So we get that fogginess in our brain because we have this insulin resistance, which also puts these protein cells that are just sort of hovering around in our body that are not really doing anything but just sort of sitting there and they're dead. And they are called, and I'm gonna read this because I wanna make sure that I get this correct for you guys. Um, they are called the, the beta amyloid proteins. And those are those proteins that are just basically sitting around in our brain and causing all this dysfunction and fogginess and um, they are the result of being in this insulin resistant state. So what puts us in this insulin resistant state? It's the process of life that we have gone through as women. Frequent um, low calorie diets, frantic exercising, having uh, gestational diabetes, having big babies, um, all of those things that we do as women have kind of set us up for this situation that we're in now as we're aging and why the whole rise of Alzheimer's is happening is because as women and what we've been trained to do through our whole life is set us up to be insulin resistant, pre-diabetic, eventually um, type two diabetic, which is gonna lead us down the road of having Alzheimer's disease. It's super scary. But the great thing is that the information now is on the forefront and we have the availability to research it. And we have some things that we can do proactively to make sure we can, if not eliminate the possibility of it for us, but delay the onset of it. And that is really why I started intermittent fasting for myself. Alzheimer's disease runs in my family. I was having all the signs and symptoms. I didn't want to go to the doctor and be put on medication. I was tired of being told I was crazy. Um, and I had all those triggers that were in place and all those pieces of the puzzle that were so nicely fitting together with my future as an Alzheimer's person. And so I started using intermittent fasting for the pure sense of what happens to your body when you're in that fasted state. I was pre-diabetic, insulin resistant, the memory stuff. Okay, so I knew that if I was in a fasted state, my body would be in a healing environment. And I knew the longer that I fasted, the bigger opportunity I had to burn off that stored glycogen, get into a fat adaptive state, and then get myself into a state of autophagy, even if it was slight, a long enough period of time to burn off all of those dead and damaged protein cells that were causing me to be as sick as I was. Healthy on the outside, appearance-wise, nobody knew I was sick. Body on the inside, my body was felt like it was slowly dying. Um, as I got better with my intermittent fasting, as I trusted the process that I was going through with intermittent fasting, as I truly understood what being in a truly fat adaptive state was because I wasn't playing games with all of those people that are on the internet saying, you can have butter coffee, you can have coconut oil, you can have 30 calories, you can have this little thing, you can have that little thing when you're fasting, it won't break your fast. It was causing my body to not heal the way I knew it would heal. And so what I really like for you guys to understand is if you're playing around with fasting on your own or on the side, you have to really get yourself into that truly fasted state for this opportunity of cleansing out your body and your brain and all of those dead and damaged protein cells that are leading us into this area as we age of slow sickness. Um, it happens gradually, it happens subtly, we're, we're told and expected to believe that it's just part of what happens to us as aging women, and it's not true. It does not have to happen that way. We have an opportunity through some very simple lifestyle changes and nutritional changes to delay that. And for a lot of us, and I, myself is included because I am a totally different woman now healed than I was two years ago, we can make ourselves feel better look better and live better by just understanding our body and understanding what's happening as we move through those phases of insulin resistance, what's, what, which is what happens first, into that pre-diabetic state. If you get to that type two diabetes state, you're on your way to type three diabetes or what is better well known as 
Alzheimer's disease. And we don't want to get to that point or we want to be able to delay that as much as we can. So this is why I am so passionate about sharing with you guys what intermittent fasting can do for us as women and how easy it is to adapt in our life once we understand those chemical processes that are going on in our body that we as women have control of if we stop listening to all the noise on the outside that's telling us that whatever sick state we're in is normal or that we're crazy or that this is just the way we're supposed to be and we need to suck it up. We don't have to suck it up. We don't have to live this way and it is not the way we were designed to be. So I strongly encourage you, do your research. If you are any of those risk factors, you've had gestational diabetes when you were pregnant, you had a big baby when you were pregnant, you've had um, the ovarian syndrome uh, that I talked about, um, you wanna make sure that you make sure that your triggers are on and that you are aware of some of the things that your body's going through because if you're at risk, then there's a really good chance if you're feeling the signs and symptoms that you're already on your way, but you have an opportunity to reverse some of those things. So take it seriously, take your health seriously, take your body seriously, and make sure that you know the things that you have in your wheelhouse that you have control of, that you can get some of those things reversed and get yourself back on track. I am feeling a hundred times better than I was two years ago when I was sick. And all of those signs and symptoms that I was feeling are gone and I'm hoping to be able to keep them away for as long as possible. Now, do I still forget things? Absolutely, I'm 51 years old, I'm a busy mother of two, I'm you know, managing my own business, I've got kids going in all kinds of places. There's sometimes I just forget things. I forget words, I forget what I'm gonna say, but the scary forget walking into a room or not knowing where I parked my car, having no memory of driving through a parking lot, those feelings are gone. And the cloudiness in my brain and the inability I had to get a job done, those are all gone. And I'm feeling so much more like my younger old self um, than I was just a couple of years ago when I was feeling sick and feeling like an old, you know, kind of done woman. Um, and I'm feeling very eager and optimistic about my future and the, and the life that I have to live as I'm aging. And I didn't have the optimis, optimism and eagerness just a couple of years ago. So if you're feeling like you are just kind of spent and you don't know what to do, join one of our groups. Um, it, within a week, you guys, uh, the women in our groups are seeing some results because we teach you how to listen to your body. We teach you how to understand food. We teach you how to take control of everything that you have going on. And there's a lot of women who've been playing around with intermittent fasting and they're feeling frustrated because they are just missing the pieces that they need to have to make it work correctly for them. And we give you all that in the first week. So don't suffer, don't struggle, um, don't feel frustrated. It should be a very simple process. You just have to figure out those little tweaks to get your body going. And I don't want you guys walking around feeling frustrated. And most importantly, I don't want you to get sick if it's something that we can help you sort of figure out on your own. I always recommend that you go see your doctor if you're feeling a little off and you don't know what's going on. You know, I would say in the least, go get some blood drawn and see where your baseline is. See where you're starting out at if you're not feeling well and see if there are some things that are showing up in your blood work that maybe you have have an opportunity to correct before you have to go on some sort of prescription regimen to kind of correct it while you're making those lifestyle changes. I was fortunate when I found my pre-diabetes kick in. I was very, I was on the borderline. I think it was a 5.9 in a um, fasted state uh, when I got my blood work done. So I was just on the brink of being, uh, you know, titled as a diabetic. And so I swiftly got in and did my research and turned some things around reverse my insulin resistance, and then everything else started falling falling into place, including losing that weight that I had been holding on for a couple years that was just stubbornly sticking there, regardless of what I was doing with crash diets and obsessive exercising. So we don't need to do that anymore either. So let me go through and check and see if you guys have any questions that I can answer uh, for you on this topic. And then we will uh, see where we're going. So my cousin Amy's here. She is a grad of my intermittent fasting group. Girlfriend looks amazing. I'm gonna start doing some interviews of um, some people who've been in my group to let them tell their stories to you guys. So we're gonna start doing that in September. It's gonna be so exciting. Stephanie, welcome. Diane, Diane, Diane in Pennsylvania. Good to have you. Faith, nice to have you here. Joy, good to see you. 
Um, Laura, good to have you. Amy, Amy, Amy. Shannon, good evening. It's so cool you guys all know each other now, so you're having your little conversations uh, going during the broadcast, which I love it. Um, Tony, I believe it is. Good evening. So glad you found us too. Martina, good to have you. I'm a type 2 diabetic with high blood sugar numbers early in the morning, but it does lower by 11 to noon-ish. Example, today, 71. Awesome. Both in a fasted state. I'm frustrated. Um, uh, Menia, you would be a perfect candidate for our course. We could teach you maybe some of those tweaks that you're missing in your fasting or feasting window that's keeping you in that kind of state of being diabetic. Vivery, struggling with type 2. Vivery, I think you're in our July 15th group, so girlfriend, we're going to get you fixed. Don't worry about it. We're going to teach you how to listen to those signs and, signs and signals that your body's sending you when you're feasting on some foods that maybe might be triggering some of your blood sugar problems. So we're going to teach you how to fix yourself. Again, I'm not a doctor. I'm only a woman who... who fixed myself and so I'm going to share you share with you guys what I did and some of the signs and signals that I listened to myself and I'm going to have you guys figure it out for yourself. So um, that's the best part of what we do in our course is we teach you how to be empowered and how to make decisions for yourself so that these kind of things are things that you won't have to live with anymore because you're going to have the tools and the experience to just leave the course and then live your life um, very healthy. Betty, good to have you from Houston. Maggie's here. Katie from the July group, finally up late enough to catch you live. Oh, good, Katie. Kate, I hope you're not tired tomorrow. Uh, Laura is here. Joanna is here. Arlene, hey, good to have you. My daughter's 15 and is diagnosed with PCOS. She is at risk for diabetes. We have her A1C checked every six months. She was pre-diabetic, and with food changes, that number has gone down. I wonder if she fasted. Um, yeah, Amy, Logan's fasting and he loves it. Um, he's a huge academic person at school, um, always striving for, you know, top of his class and all that. And he noticed that fasting really helps him clear his mind and his, uh, his grades uh, were soaring and he says he has a lot better time studying. And so he's fasting for SAT and ACT tests and all that kind of stuff this summer. Hey, Pamela. Um, fasting has created such an amazing feeling in my body. Head is clear, energy up, and have lost 24 pounds. Yeah, and, and you, look, you look amazing, Amy. I don't think I've ever seen you look so good. Leslie's here. Uh, hyperthyroid due to brings new problems. I know. What, what you, f when you fast, must it be the same time and duration? Uh, Justine, we teach that in the class. Uh, hi from Devon. Can't wait for July. I think you're, Caroline, I think you're July 15th. That's this weekend. So you're going to, you're close. Ingrid's here. I will tell Savannah. She would be excited to hear that. Yeah. Here's the thing. When you're, when you're working with your teens or your kids about fasting, the biggest thing is to not hype or like harp, hype, harp on them about fasting. So what we did with, what I did with my kids is I just stopped forcing breakfast down their throat. And if you think about the breakfast options that most of us have for our kids, they're not the best way for our kids to start off their day. Generally, my kids were having cereal or a waffle, even though it was like a healthier version of a waffle or a healthier version of cereal, it's still loaded with carbohydrates. And then if you throw some milk on there, you got a bunch of sugar in your milk. Um, we've switched to almond milk, but the way I got my kids to switch to almond milk was um, to have them drink the chocolate almond milk. That's the only one they liked, so that had sugar in it too. So you're sending your kids off to school with a brain full of sugar and carbohydrates they probably can't break down. So I just started by asking my kids, are you hungry in the morning? And if they said no, I just sent them to school with a really healthy snack and a really hearty lunch. And they were able to eat when they were in their body, signaled to them that they needed to eat. And then when they got home, we always have a really balanced, healthy dinner. So that's how I kind of controlled it for them and eased them into it. And now they kind of wake up and just have their meal whenever they feel like eating it, but it's not a forced breakfast down their throat, which is the way we've been trained to, to feed our kids, right? We've been trained to feed them like you have to eat breakfast before you go to school. You have to eat breakfast. It's the healthiest meal of the day. And that's just not true. So the best thing to do is just not force your kids to eat. Let them eat when their body's telling them that it's ready. Allison was diagnosed pre-diabetic and hypothyroidism a month ago, started 16, 8, now 24 and feeling awesome and lost five pounds of the stubborn fat that I have held on for four weeks. Awesome, Allison, it's going to get better. That 20 hour fast and the four hour feast is what we commonly refer to as the sweet spot. And we refer to, we refer to it as the sweet spot because that's the best opportunity for a woman's body to heal. 
Sandra Hillsday, Sherry from New Mexico, Yvonne, hello, Shirley, hello. Um, hopefully I didn't start a whole new broadcast on my YouTube fell off and came back on. Good day from Scotland. Wow, Scotland, welcome. Shirley, Kettley, I think it is, Crystal, good evening, Elaine, happy to be able to catch you live, I'm on a roll, loving IF, Angel, good to have you, Brown Eyes, good evening, uh, Doreen, hello, hi from Chicagoland in the July group, and now so glad to finally catch a live chat, oh, glad to have you here, Ellie, moved over from Facebook because I could not see or hear you, oh, good, glad you can get a better reception on YouTube, Monica, hello, Long Beach, good, Evelyn, happy to be here tonight, loving IF and sharing the wealth with family and friends, doing 24, and I think I found my sweet spot. Thanks, Diane, for all the July. Yeah, so 24 is the sweet spot. Uh, brown eyes, diet. I went almost 24 hours today before eating, and I still wasn't hungry. I'm doing something wrong. I think all I drink is plain water, and today I had some herbal tea. I'm in the keto state. Is my body eating my fat? <laughs> I think so, brown eyes. We'll work on that. Um, Patricia, hello. I'm excited to July 15th group. Yes, it's starting soon. Alicia from Atlanta in the July group was diagnosed with pre-diabetes pre last year, age 50, hoping to reverse it with IF. Glad to be here. Alicia, you should be able to do it. I did it pretty easily. Um, and if you're starting to feel better, that's usually a sign that it is in the reversal state. So just keep doing what you're doing. Hey, girl, keep up the great work. Oh, awesome. Gestational diabetes here. Yeah, Yvonne. So, but you're... Girlfriend, you're home free. You don't have to worry about it. You're a fasting pro. You're uh, fat adaptive. You're working out. You won't have to worry about it, hopefully. Patricia, hope you had a winning day so far. I did have a great day. I had some amazing consult calls today. Loved it. Super, super great day for me. Um, I have for life, yes. Can you tell us what brand of collagen is the best for aging women? Uh, um, Ariadra, I think it is. Ariandra. Email me. Shirley, oh my God, type 3 diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. Grateful. Yeah. Yeah, it's scary. And the warning. Yep. Okay, 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 okay. Let's see where I got. I'm feeling both happy for the information and I, I, of course, and sad because of what our doctors haven't told us. Oh, that's okay. Don't feel sad. Feel empowered. I, I, I don't like to feel sad about what doctors don't tell us. I like to feel empowered because the reality is at some point we might need our doctors. So we want to make sure we keep a healthy relationship with them. But we want to make sure that when we go into our doctors, like I go into my doctors like this with a, with a bunch of paper. And I'm like, let's chat. And I don't let them dictate to me what happens to me. I let them give me their medical information or their medical opinion. And then I intercept with my information and we meet a happy balance. Never go into a doctor's office uninformed or, uh, or, uh, or without your own little like information pack that you can either counteract what they're saying or contribute to what they're saying. And then together, you and your doctor should reach an agreement of what treatment you think is best for you or what medicine you think is best for you or what plan is best for you. Here's another little tip, ladies. Did you know that when you go to the doctor, you don't have to be weighed or you don't have to hear what the number is? Um, you can decline that. So if weight is one of those things that freaks you out, just say, no, thank you. I declined to step on the scale today. Like you don't have to even step on the scale and have to hear what they have to say to you about that. That's your own thing. You don't have to do that. Um, and the same thing with when you go to a doctor, take what they have to say. If it's not a life threatening situation, I always say, thank you so much for the information. I'm going to go sit on it for a couple days, do some research and I'll get back to you. One experience that I had that was super scary where I didn't do my due diligence and I was just super scared because I felt so bad was when I had shingles really, really bad. And they kept putting me on this antiviral medication to try to fix it. And I think when I got to the fifth one and the shingles just kept getting worse and kept getting worse and kept getting worse. Um, and I got to the point where I had migraines and was feeling depressed. And I'm not a depressed person, like depressed, sad, crying for no reason depressed. I started to do my research. And they kept experimenting with these antiviral medications and nothing was working for my body. Within about an hour of researching on the internet, I found out that L lysine, which is a mineral in our body that um, I um, probably was just deficient in because if you eat a lot of raw nuts and you eat a lot of oats, and I think there's something else that you eat in your body that's considered healthy, makes you deficient in L lysine. So I um, found out that if I mega dosed on L lysine for 24 hours and then took a standard dose for a week that I could cure myself of what I had with my shingles. 
So four months of experimental antiviral medication, which led me to migraines, which I'd never had before, and a state of very scary depression for me that I felt like I wasn't going to be able to get out of, was all reversed by $4.99 bottle of Target brand L-Lysine that I mega dosed with in, in 24 hours. I immediately felt relief from my shegals and within three or four days they were gone. So that that is one of those situations where I kind of went into the doctor and went, okay, okay, okay. And I took this medicine that doesn't wasn't doing anything for me and something that I was able to pick up at my local Target cured me within, you know, 24 hours the symptoms were better and within a few days it was totally gone. So I always say I am the woman that will always have a very fresh bottle of L-Lysine rotating through my supplement uh, cupboard because if I ever felt the shingles coming on again, and I don't know if you know this, but if you've had chicken pox and then you get shingles, you're very highly likely to get them again. I will always mega dose on L-Lysine and I will, I mean, yeah, now L-Lysine and I'll get that out of my system ASAP. So little known piece of information today about uh, shingles and one of those situations where if I was just a little bit more informed or had the experience, I probably wouldn't have had to go through all of that with those with the medicines they were giving me that weren't working. Okay, let's see where I stopped up <clears throat> over here on uh, YouTube. How you figured, oh, so, so happy, better, yeah. Great results here, love ladies in our group, okay, cool. Um, I started out full force doing 24. I honestly think I can go the full 24, just one meal. How often should I do this? Brown eyes, we'll have to figure that out when you're in our group. Uh, Dana, also have been diagnosed as pre-diabetic, struggling to quit sugar and alcohol, trying to do 20 hour fast. Okay, here, uh, Dana, what you need to do is you need to just do it for a month. Don't worry about uh, giving up the sugar. The, the sooner you give up the sugar and the less alcohol you consume, the less you crave and your body demands sugar. You have to just kind of get through it for the first couple of days. You should probably join our course. We will help you get it through, get through it. Once you get off the sugar dependency, it's really easy. Um, it's, it, it's easy once you get off of it. It's not easy to get off of it, but in our group, we help you with that. Uh, my A1C was 5.8. Uh, Yvonne, have you had your A1C tested lately? Marina, can you explain insulin resistance a little more and how reversing works and how long it takes generally? Marina, I'll do a whole talk on insulin resistance. That would take us way too late into the night. So um, I'll, I'll do one on insulin resistance, maybe tomorrow night. Patricia, I was diagnosed with pre-diabetes this last April. I've worked from, I, I have worked from IF, 16, 8, 18, 6, 24 today. It was not as hard as I thought it would be. I'm looking forward to the course. Awesome. Denise, I don't have too many nice things to say about our medical system today. I don't trust and uh, I believe we know how to feel. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to become like a medical bashing community here. And I know people have had their own personal experiences. So I always respect when people feel the way they do. I always just say go in empowered, go in informed and know that that what you do with your health is your right. Um, um, and then and then you can kind of take it into your own hands. Cynthia. Uh, awesome, awesome job, Cynthia. Uh, listening intently, biggest problem is fatigue. Okay, fatigue can often come from the insulin resistance too, so um, you want to make sure you get that checked out. I fasted, lost six pounds. Amazing. Awesome, Shirley. Tanya, thanks for this today. Went to physical this morning and 5.6 A1C. I need this. Tanya, are you in our group? If not, you should get in. Carolyn, I know you were talking about diabetes, but do you have any info on fasting and thyroid? Yes, fasting works for thyroid issues as well. We had some women, I think in our May and June group, who were able to um, uh, lower their thyroid dose, their medicine, medicine dosage, and they're hoping to get off it completely. Such a great new word for me. I am empowered. Yep, empowered. Angela, science is ever evolving and doctors are always learning. Find a DO if possible. My daughter is a DO and she's 100% on board with IF. Yeah, so you just have to find the right doctor too. So, you know, a lot of doctors, you know, um, they branch off and kind of do their own little side um, uh, research and education and are a little bit more on the holistic side of thing or the patient, let the patient be their own advocate. So interview your doctor and make sure you find the one that's going to kind of best help you and what you want to um, um um, you know, detail for your own life. And if a doctor is adamant about just pushing prescriptions on you and doesn't want to listen to you, then it's probably not the doctor for you. Jody, and that's why I see a neuropath. Yep. Yep. Brown eyes, I'm in your group. Okay, cool. Yeah, so brown eyes, yeah, you are, because Linda, I just had a talk with you. Um, 
your stuff will get balanced out. The longer you fast, you guys remember I talked about it before. I have been on this journey for two years. One year, the first year I started researching intermittent fasting, I did the play around with it, tried to cheat my way through it, didn't really understand what a true fasted state was and suffered painfully for a year. Probably made my situation even worse, trying to do all these little trick add-ins and fancy coffees and stuff. It wasn't until I got really, really serious about changing my health that I was able to get well. And I had to really listen to my body and the signs and signals that it was sending to me and understand the chemical processes that went on and what causes your hormones to be all out of whack. And I had to make some very serious decisions. And the decision that I made was that I want to be healthy for my grandkids and my kids. I have a 17 year old and an almost 11 year old and I'm 51. I don't have time to play games and I want to be able to rem remember my kids and I want to know my grandkids when I'm in my 60s and 70s. I don't have time to play games. So when I made decisions about sort some of the foods that I was going to give up, um, it was easy. It was an easy decision for me to make. It was easy because I never ever ever again in my life want food to be more powerful than my family and I don't want food to be more powerful than my happiness and I don't want food to be more powerful than me and my health. And so when you make those kind of very blunt in your own face kind of decisions about your life, nothing tastes as good as those decisions. And so it's very easy to walk away from things that you may have cravings for. It's very easy to walk away from things that are convenient. It's very easy to get through a 24 hour fast or a 24 hour or a 20 hour fast when you have a decision that you've made for yourself that is from your heart and involves people that you love and, and things that are in your future that you don't even know about yet, but you hope to be part of. Um, and that's really when I'm, um, I, I said enough is enough and I will, I will not allow myself to get sick if I am the one that's in control of it. And here's the other thing that I, that I really am serious about with my health and I really try to get you guys to understand too, is if in the event that you end up becoming sick with something that you was just out of the blue. And, and, and when those kind of situations happen, they do just make you like, they knock your feet out from under you. And it happens to people we know every day. If that ever happens to me, I want to be game ready. I want to be as healthy as I possibly can be, despite whatever it is that just was told to me about my health. And I want to go in fighting. I don't want to have to be, I don't want to have to make up anything to fight something off. So I'm always game ready. I'm always ready for the fight. I'm always ready for the game. Whatever I got to be, I want to be as, as healthy in my body, as healthy in my heart, as healthy in my mind, as healthy in my faith as I can possibly be so I can fight. And so we don't have time to play around with these things that are, that are bringing us down that we have control over. So if you have control over whether you're going to be a type 2 diabetic or you're insulin resistant, then, then you need to take the action to fix that and put yourself in a healthy state because we don't want to take our chances with something more serious creeping up on us and then we're sickly going into a fight. So do it for those reasons too. Um, do it for the reason that if something were to come up that you had no control over, you're in, you're in fight mode and that you're in the most healthy, the healthiest position you can be in in all aspects of your life to put up a fight for your life if that's what the situation warrants. So you want to be healthy in your body. You want to be healthy in your mind. You want to be healthy in your heart. And whatever your faith or spiritual uh, surroundings are in your life, you want to make sure you're healthy there too because we don't want to have to make up any lost time if we're in the fight for our life. So I do it for my kids. I do it for my future grandkids. I do it for my husband. I do it for myself. And I do it for all of those reasons too because I don't want to get caught off guard and then not know what to do to help myself. Um, sorry, I got a little deep there, but that's just the way I feel. And that's, what I, that's why I really want you guys to feel as well. Um, yes, it helps cholesterol um, totally. Uh, Pre-diabetic in April, down 40 pounds with IF. Joy, I can't wait till you get your um, your uh, A1C levels tested again. How many hours for intermittent fasting? I did 15 hours today. Uh, you have to kind of figure that out for yourself. I agree, Diane, you're a great motivator. Oh, surely, thank you. Um, dang, Diane, you may, may have just opened up another path for your life as a motivational speaker. <laughs> I don't know. 
Um, Christine, I am so on board with you on that. Okay, cool. Good. Christine, stay on board. I think, too, here's the deal. Okay, I, this is another thing, and I'm going to get off on this little soapbox a little bit. I don't have any consult calls tonight, so I get a little extra time. Okay, so here's another thing. Who are you surrounding yourself with in your life? And I know that there's certain people that are in our life, and they're part of our life, and they're there, and we love them for being part of our life. But then there's those people, I call them like sort of the, the outliers or the acquaintances, the people that we think they're our friends, but in certain situations may just be acquaintances and we gotta figure out where to put them in their place. So if you're doing something healthy for your life, like fasting or changing the way you're eating or trying to reverse some, something that you have going on in your body that's not good and you're trying to make it better and your friends ridicule you or ostracize you or make fun of you or alienate you dude you got to get some new friends <laughs> like you got to find some people that are going to that are going to be on board with you and help you and not try to throw you off track and here's here's how you figure that out go to a party with a bunch of women and just listen to the conversation most often the conversation goes something like this oh man these night sweats are killing me or I have all these hot flashes or um, my leg cramps or I can't lose this 40 pounds or the medication like everybody has a complaint right and you're the one sitting over there the crazy one who's fasting that's like God, I don't have to deal with that anymore I don't have insomnia I'm not uh, I don't have uh, elevated elevated blood levels anymore I don't have leg cramps I don't I just lost 40 pounds I didn't even have to diet like you don't even have anything in common with those people anymore but man the second you bring up the word fasting or I'm fasting today or no thank you I'm in my fasting window people think you're crazy or you're doing something extreme yet all they do is complain about how horrible they feel or how horrible they they feel about how their body looks or how miserable their life is and those are our friends right so I always say make sure and this is why I love this community of women here because we are all super supportive of each other with the exception of a few critical people who post things on after the fact everyone's super supportive and so I say surround yourself with those people if it's just here we get you we understand you we know that if you fasted for 24 hours how hard that is and we will applaud you and not think you're crazy so make sure you're connected with people who get you who understand you who are going to support you and are going to make sure that you know that you're doing great things for yourself that aren't crazy because we're in the same boat as you so don't let those people who don't get you get you down um, and just make sure that when you're around them like I, I would say this too you do not have to announce the fact that you're fasting. You do not have to announce the time of day that you're eating. No one walks around with signs saying that they ate at 8 and they ate at 10 and they ate at 12 and how many grams of carbs they had and how little fat they have because that's what most other people are doing. You don't have to announce that. That's your own personal business. It is not your responsibility to, to inform people what you have going on in your house behind closed doors. It's okay if you keep things to yourself. Then what's going to happen is you're going to go to a party in a couple months and those same exact people who would ridicule you or make fun of you or tell you that you're crazy are going to say, girlfriend, what are you doing? You look amazing. And you're not going to have any complaints about your life and then they're not going to think you're so crazy. So mom's the word in the very beginning while you're making these great changes for yourself around people who don't understand and then let them come to you and ask you what it is that you've been doing that's making you look and feel so great because they're going to want a piece of that action. And that's when you have power and that's when you have control and that's when you can be that gracious person that pays it forward and can help another woman be in the same position that you are and that's what I love about this community and I know a lot of you are sharing it with people who are asking your questions and you're getting them on board and you're inviting them to these videos so I, I totally congratulate you on that you are doing a great thing and the more women that we have who are changing their health and reversing some of those health issues and are becoming educated experienced and empowered with what it is that they're doing with their health the, then we have the power as women to change so many things because we know as women we're the power changers and we're the ones who are the influencers and we're the ones that are going to support the other people that are around us so we have that power and we have that opportunity and I don't take that lightly and I hope that you guys don't take that lightly either set a good example and um, and you'll get people that are following you I think we had three messages this week about husbands who are jumping on board with their wives 
and it's on there, we're just in the midsection of week two of our intermittent fasting group. Resistant husbands who are jumping on board with their wives, and now the husbands and the wives are living the same lifestyle that's going to lead them into a very healthy rest of their life. And we all work so hard to get ourselves to that point where we get our kids out of the house doing their own thing, living their own great, amazing life that we've set them up for. And then we want to settle into a really nice retirement with our husbands. We don't want to be sick, and we don't want our husbands to be sick. So let's set a good example of how easy this is and how we can change our lifestyle and how we can change the things that we have that everyone thinks that we're supposed to get. Prove that it doesn't have to happen that way and then bring our people that we love on board with us. So that's my talk for tonight. We went from diabetes to, what do we go to? To shingles to empowerment. And so I hope you guys get how passionate I am about this. I take this very seriously. I don't think that any of us should have to suffer this diabetes thing if we if we don't want to. And it is, for a lot of us, a choice. It may be some work. We may have to take some stages to get through it. But we all want to make sure that we're remembering everything in our life, and especially the ones that we love as we age. And we, there's so much information out there that we, we need to take it seriously and then do the work to make sure that we are those women who um, can live our lives looking and feeling our best and most up most importantly for me is being authentic as we go through it. So I'm going to sign off tonight, let you guys kind of sit on that for a little bit. I'll be back tomorrow night. I will talk about insulin resistance tomorrow night. I'll share with you guys some of the things that I was going through and some of the things I was ignoring um, until I got really serious with how bad I was feeling and some of the things I was thinking in my own mind and then the action that I took to kind of reverse those things. So join me tomorrow night. We'll talk specifically about insulin resistance and some of the things that you might want to look for and some things that you can do to retain, re change those things for yourself. So as always, I love you guys. Thank you for being here. Um, if you would like to join the July 15th group, both of the links have been posted on Facebook and YouTube. Click that link, get in. You are, we start on Saturday. So that means you're like a week and a half away from making some very amazing changes in your life. So if you've been struggling for months, think about a week and a half, you could be in a completely different place of how you're feeling with your body and how you're living the rest of your life. Don't hesitate, get in with us. I will see you guys tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, live here on Facebook and live here on YouTube. Have a good night.